greater Yellowstone ecosystem of southwest Montana, there is one keystone species whose very existence has been threatened, the white bark pine. I wanted to learn more about what is happening to white bark pines, so I enlisted the help of biologists Steve Prim and Jay Frederick, who have been studying white bark pines in the mountains surrounding the Madison Valley. It's early April in the Madison Valley, and the only way to reach white bark pines this time of year is by foot. We drive about 20 miles southeast to the base of the Madison Range, a spectacular range of mountains rising over 11,000 feet and home to numerous threatened species including wolves and grizzly bears. Jay and Steve have offered to guide myself and a hard-working film crew to the white bark pine habitat. Able to live for up to 450 years, white bark pines thrive in the high elevation forests of western North America, usually between 8 and 10,000 feet. As we quickly gain elevation, we pass through stands of limber pine, a tree closely related to white bark pine. So close, in fact, Steve tells me, that the only way to tell the difference between the two is by examining the cones. We continue up the side of the mountain. Our movement keeps us warm in the below freezing temperature. After a challenging two hour hike, Steve spots a white bark pine along a windswept ridge. This harsh terrain at about 8,500 feet is where the white bark pine typically thrives. These are very harsh sites, so it's, it's a tough existence up here. Now we've got a couple of pathogens that seem to be working on white bark pine and doing a fairly good job at producing mortality here. White bark pines are able to get a foothold here. They play a fairly in influential role in the ecosystem up here. They have broad crowns that hold a lot of snow. So they trap snow, um, which influences the hydrology of these sites, leads to so soil building, so other plants can, can get established on these sites, affects the timing and amount of runoff. They're, they're actually very important uh, ecological health of sites like this. They also produce a large fatty nut that, that's important for a lot of wildlife species. I think something on the order of 110 different wildlife species have been documented as using white bark as a food source. There's some argument that, that white bark and the Clark's nutcracker have sort of co-evolved together. The Clark's nutcracker doesn't necessarily only feed on white bark pine. However, the link with the Clark's nutcracker and white bark pine seems to be in the establishment of forests. They'll um, take apart the cones when the, when the cones are getting ripe. They'll, they'll be sitting on, on the, in the crowns of the trees, pecking apart the cones. They'll fill up these little cheek pouches. They'll peck into the ground a little ways, and then, then you'll see them go like this. And, and magically, a seed will appear inside their beak, and then they, and they drop it in the ground. So it provides a food source, and in turn, the white bark pine kind of gets planted in new places by, by the Clark's Nutcracker. We see white bark pine forests become established, or stands become established on harsh sites sometimes following fire, and typically by Clark's Nutcracker, or we think almost solely by Nutcracker in some, some instances. As hardy as the white bark pine is, biologists are deeply concerned about a series of threats to the white bark pine survival in this part of the country. White pine blister rust um, is imported from Europe and Asia. It's a non-native fungus. It um, came ashore uh, in western North America at Vancouver in about 1910. Our trees here have very little resistance to, to blister rust. In places like Glacier National Park and the Canadian Rockies, we've seen 80, 90 percent mortality due to blister rust over time. This tree is um, somewhat infected with blister rust, probably going to lose the battle to it um, from the looks of things. A um, couple of blister rust diagnostics, um, you can see the what we call spindle-shaped swelling of this branch out here. So this branch is dead, actually. In a case like this, the top of this tree is probably going to die, and that's where the cones are usually produced, is up there in the crown of the tree, um, either seriously compromising or ending the life of one of these trees. But a more recent threat is devastating whitebark pine stands in Montana. Only five millimeters long, the mountain pine beetle has expanded its range into higher elevations and into whitebark pine habitat. Mountain pine beetle, because of a series of warm winters, most likely, and, and drought conditions, has actually been able to move up into the white bark pine stands at these higher elevations and start killing lots and lots of white bark pine. So they're a native pest. Um, they're, they're always out there. They tended not to get way up here on these high, inhospitable ridges for, for a variety of reasons and attack white bark pine. And what you can see here are a, a series of spots where sap has moved out of 
one of the holes that were created by the mountain pine beetle. And again, the theory is that the, the tree produces a, a high degree of sap, try to isolate the mountain pine beetle and to, uh, to kill that pine beetle before the attack progresses or to the point where it kills the tree. If you look very closely, you see a whole series of additional holes where it, mountain pine beetles have invaded the tree and have uh, eventually killed it. The combination of blister rust and mountain pine beetle is actually pretty bad, but blister rust is actually very efficient at killing little bitty trees. So the little trees that could grow up to repopulate uh, a stand of white bark pine are getting killed by blister rust, and the big trees are getting killed by mountain pine beetle. Um, so it's, it's a real double whammy. But there is a third threat that uh, is more mechanical in nature. So the structure of uh, subalpine fir will overtower white bark pine. At that time, white bark pine being less shade tolerant than uh, subalpine fir will start to die out. It's fairly certain that that is related to suppression of fire over time and, and fire suppression allowing continued establishment and continued development of, of subalpine fir. How will these die-offs of white bark pine affect the animals that depend on them for food? Research on grizzly bear diets in nearby Yellowstone National Park revealed that in years of good white bark pine cone crops, over half of the grizzly bear's protein comes from white bark pine nuts alone. One of the mainstays um, for grizzly bear's annual food source here has been white bark pine. What the research has demonstrated is that in a good white bark pine year, the, um, the number of conflicts between bears and people go way, goes way down because the bears are up here away from people using a high quality food resource. In a bad year, those female grizzlies will often be down in lower elevations looking for food. They may be food stressed and impatient, and they may end up making some bad decisions that get them into trouble with people. So now we've got a big population of bears, and we're faced with the prospect of them losing a key food resource fairly rapidly. The high number of bears is what's driving the delisting process. So we start losing bears, and we get below, I think the magic number is 400. We could be right back in the, the same game with the threatened status of the grizzly bear. In the Madison Valley, the Forest Service and several environmental groups are attempting to save the whitebark pine by identifying individual trees that have been able to resist blister rust. But what we're doing is, in, in many areas, looking for what appear to be rust-resistant trees. Uh, and those are, those are trees that seem to be fending off white pine blister rust, uh, or remaining healthy throughout this, throughout, throughout this period. So we've identified those and call them plus trees. Uh, and we're trying to protect those from mountain pine beetle at this point. We apply the pheromone directly to the tree uh, at various heights on the tree. In essence, what it does is it, it lets off um, a synthetic pheromone that, that suggests to the, the beetle that the tree is already occupied or fully occupied. Eventually, what we hope to do is established a series of uh, seed orchards based on uh, geographic, geographic regions and uh, grow trees that are, are uh, originated within the, those geographic areas in these seed orchards uh, with, with an eye towards eventually doing some reforestation over hopefully some fairly large areas. As we hike back down the mountain to warmer temperatures, I think about the implications of white bark pine disappearing from Montana. If it is truly a keystone species, its disappearance will disrupt the entire ecosystem. How will it affect biodiversity in the alpine regions? Will the animals who depend on its nutritious nuts find another food source? What will be the fate of the Yellowstone grizzly bear with such an important food source gone? One can argue that humans are largely responsible for the decline of the white bark pine. We introduced blister rust from Europe, We've suppressed fire, and we've contributed to global warming, which has allowed pine beetles to expand their range into higher elevations. Who knows if we can reverse this damage, but I think we have a responsibility to try. And the efforts of people like Jay and Steve should be an example for the rest of us. Mm -hmm.